Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, I'd love for you to turn to Matthew chapter 17, where we'll pick up the story. And, and as we get started, I want to pose a couple questions to you um, as we prepare to hear uh, the first part of this morning's uh, passage. And so you might write these questions down as they, they might be questions that, that sort of connect with you, maybe one of them, maybe all three. Um, but I, I want to come back to these uh, throughout uh, the message. And, and the first question would be this, what do you need? from God in order to trust him. The second question is, what would you, sorry, my wife has told me that I'm speaking too fast, so I will slow down. Uh, what do you need from God in order to trust him is the first question. The second question is, what would you do if God spoke to you? And then the third question is, how would a dramatic encounter with God affect you? as a follower of Jesus? How would a dramatic encounter with God affect you as a follower of Jesus? Jane, was that slow enough? Just pause for a second. Pause. <laughs> yes, repeating the third one. You should just go through all Okay, one, what do you need from God in order to trust him? Two, what would you do if God spoke to you? And three, how would a dramatic encounter with God affect you as a follower of Jesus? And so we'll pick up the story in Matthew chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves, the four of them. And Jesus was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And Peter was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and he touched them, saying, Rise. And have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. <coughs> Peter, James, and John have a dramatic mountaintop experience. Jesus changes his form in front of them. Moses and Elijah, guys long since dead, appear. A cloud overshadows them and a voice comes from the cloud. This is huge. Last week we explored Peter's confession. And so Peter shows back up in our story. And last week Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God. And we, we wondered together, where does this knowledge come from? Did God just drop it into Peter's mind? Did it just appear in his heart? Did he think it? Did he feel it? The point that Jesus made last week was that regardless of where, of how Peter came to confess it, the knowledge came from God. It was not something he had heard or seen, but it had been just given to him. But everything changes this week. Peter and James and John, they see. They catch a glimpse of the Son of God in all of his radiating glory. He stands there with Moses and Elijah. Moses, the great lawgiver. Elijah, the great prophet. And Jesus stands with the law and the prophets. God's spoken word. On Mount Sinai, through Moses, God asked Israel to listen to him and to do what he was saying. 
And through prophets like Elijah, God asked Israel to listen to him and to do what he was saying. And then at the sermon on the, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, in chapters 5 through 7 of, of Matthew, Jesus concludes that sermon by saying, listen to me and do what I'm saying. But now here on another mountain at another time, God speaks directly to Peter and James and John, recipients of that first sermon by Jesus to tell them that the Jesus they follow, the Jesus who teaches and who commands, is not just another prophet. He's not just another Moses who's come to give a new sort of law. Jesus is the Son of God who faithfully serves his Father and who speaks the Father's true words. And so listen to him, God says. And these three disciples respond in an appropriate way, in a familiar way. They fall on their faces terrified. Why were they terrified? Why would they fall on their faces? Because as the scriptures tell us over and over again, that when somebody encounters God in such a direct way, uh, it always seems to have this effect on humans, right? The Israelites before God at Mount Sinai tremble in revelation. John falls before God as though dead. Even when God sends his messengers, like in the, the birth stories, birth announcement stories of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, people are generally not prepared for such direct encounters with God or his messengers. And so these meetings tend to scare the bejeebus out of people who experience them. Peter, James, and John, they're terrified by the voice that they hear, by the encounter they have with God. So maybe this should be our litmus test. When someone tells us that God spoke to them, maybe we should ask them to see their pants. We can look for the grass stains on their knees. I don't know what you think I might have been suggesting about their pants, but I want to know if they fell on the ground. That's what I want to know. Or we can just ask them. On a scale of like sound of music to whatever the scariest music, uh, movie you can imagine is Shining, The Exorcist, whatever, right? On a scale of those, how afraid were you when God spoke to you? It's worth pointing out that the New Testament as a whole suggests that this experience that Peter, James, and John have is fairly unique among all of the disciples, that audible voices from heaven are not part of the disciples' ongoing daily experience of following Jesus. This isn't sort of standard for the way that God speaks to his people. And so, thinking back to the questions that I posed to you at the beginning, uh, what do you need from God in order to trust him? What would you do if God spoke to you? And how would a dramatic encounter with God affect you as a follower of Jesus? Thinking about that first one, what do you need from God in order to trust him? Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever tried to answer that question? It, do you need, do you require a sign of some sort? Do you look for or hope that God might give you an experience of some kind? Is God's word enough to prompt your trust? Because signs and experiences are what were central for Israel as Israel spent time with God in the wilderness. They experienced God in countless ways. God was constantly giving them signs before they were in the wilderness, during the wilderness, through the wilderness, after the wilderness. At every point, God is giving them signs. And it's tempting to imagine that if we had seen the sorts of things that they saw, if we had the experiences that they had, that our trust would never waver as it did for the Israelites. But rather than seek God, what Israel ended up doing was seeking more signs and more experiences. They wanted more water, they wanted more food, they wanted more mighty works. And when we come to the Gospels, we find that the same exact story is being told by the Gospel writers. See, the crowds are drawn to Jesus by his mighty works, but the crowds dwindle away as soon as they hear the cost of following Jesus. 
And the religious leaders, they jump up to say that we are ready to follow, but give us a sign. And Jesus refuses to give them a sign. And then the disciples, the sweet, wonderful disciples, they are given both sign and experience. They experience the authoritative teaching of Jesus on the mountain. They experience the nature controlling power and rebuke of Jesus on the sea. They experience the satisfying abundance of Jesus feeding them and the multitude. And they experience the the excitement of being part of the inner circle of a man who is captivating the minds and the hearts of a country. I mean, this is a group of guys with no shortage of experiences and no drought of signs. Peter, James, and John now have the definitive experience of all experience, the sign of all signs. A voice from heaven speaks to them. How much greater of a sign could you possibly experience? And so the question becomes, well, how does this change them? How does it affect who they are? And so we read in verse 14. When they came to the crowd, they've just come down the mountain. A man came up to him, to Jesus, and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son. For he is an epileptic and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, Oh, trustless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, because of your little trust. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. These two stories back to back do something interesting. They remind us in part of the story that we heard last week, the story of Peter confessing Jesus as the Messiah, where God reveals something to Peter in one moment and then allows Peter to run wild in the next, showing just how little he understands. And what we discover in the the two stories back to back about Peter last week is that revelation without understanding is dangerous. In fact, it might even stand against the God who does the revealing. And now in this passage this week, we learn that revelation without trust is powerless. God revealed himself to Peter, James, and John. And while Peter, James, and John now have a a story to tell, or not to tell since Jesus told them not to say anything, but they can tell eventually when the Son of Man is raised from the dead, which doesn't really make sense to them because they still can't accept that Jesus is going to die. But when he does and when he is raised, then they will understand and then they will have a story to tell. Got that? Okay, in spite of this story, which they can't tell yet, the story that they have seen and heard and experienced They're unable to follow Jesus as he's instructed them. Back in chapter 10, we looked at specific words Jesus spoke to these specific people. Jesus gave his 12 disciples authority to cast out demons and to heal. And here, three of them, having heard God speak from heaven, still are not able to trust Jesus, his words, or his authority. This is pretty significant. It's also powerful for us, I think, when we realize that the Gospels were written by or around the apostles, these 12. That that these 12 are the ones who would later have a say in what stories were told about Jesus and what stories were told about themselves. And that so often, as in this story right here, These people do not come out as heroes 
as the story is being told. They're a group of people who, having seen far more than any of us will ever see, and having experienced Jesus in the flesh in a way that none of us in this life will, they struggled to trust. They struggled to follow faithfully. And when, at some point, understanding finally came, when trust finally began to mark their lives and they began to tell these stories of Jesus, the Messiah and his kingdom, it's interesting to me that they don't forget their own failures and they don't hide their failures, but they learn from them and they offer them to us in the gospels for us to learn from as well. That we might see in Jesus' ongoing relationship with the disciples, the kindness of God, the mercy of God that continues to call. Because failure is a part of the journey. We fail to trust. We fail to do the things that Jesus has instructed us to do. And what does it look like for us to recognize our failure and to fix our eyes on Jesus and to, to continue to walk? Part of that is recognizing the things that we failed to do, though Jesus has instructed us, things like making disciples. It's interesting that pretty much every, anywhere I go, because I'm a pastor, people always ask me, tell me about your church, or how are things going at your church, or, or questions like that, right? And my favorite response goes like, something like, we are learning how to make disciples together. And this is not usually the answer that people are looking for. Uh, and, and one time someone said to me, I couldn't do that. Uh, and so I asked her, do you have a relationship with God? When she said yes, I told her that she can make disciples and she must if she claims to trust Jesus because this is something that he said we would do as a part of following him. Somewhere in the church's re recent history, uh, the church got a memo that seemed to turn disciple making into a sort of optional activity for Christians. In our passage, Jesus tells the disciples that they are unable to heal this man's son because they have so little trust. It's worth asking the question, what do we need from God in order to trust him? Are his words enough or do we demand more? Which moves us to the second question that I asked you to consider. What would you do if God spoke to you? And I don't presume to know what God will do uh, for you, uh, for us, from this point to the rest of history, uh, through the rest of history. Perhaps he will speak to you uh, with a voice from heaven, but you would be one of the rare few to have had such an experience in the history of the church. What I do know is that God has spoken, that God has spoken through his prophets, that God has spoken through his son. God's word to Peter, James, and John was listen. And while, while they fall down in terror at the sound of his voice, when it comes to listening to the voice of God's son, of Jesus, at this point in the story, they remain largely unaffected by what they've heard. So turn with me to chapter 18, starting in verse 1. The disciples come to Jesus, and in spite of Everything that he's taught up until this point about humility, about reordering uh, the community, about sacrifice and service, they ask him, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus responds by, by calling a little child and placing the child among the disciples and saying this, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Man, these are some really strong words from Jesus. For someone who, as we've been reading together, can sometimes be a bit mysterious. A guy who, who likes to speak in parables so as to not be clear. Thanks for that, Jesus. And who can often make things tough on his hearers. 
There's no difficulty here. Children belong in the midst of those who would gather around Jesus. There's something about children that teach us to humble ourselves so that we might find an appropriate place among Jesus' followers. This is not the first time that Jesus has instructed the disciples in these ways, or in this way. At this point, he's just really restating what he's already said, and he's using children as an example. But, but a chapter later, in Matthew, th- uh, Matthew 19, verse 13, we read, Then children were brought to Jesus, so that he might lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. God has spoken from a vo- with a voice from heaven to Peter, James, and John, telling them to listen to his son, Jesus. Jesus has told them that children have a place of importance in his kingdom, and they still can't be bothered by children. It shouldn't surprise us that the disciples as a whole, due to the people bringing children to Jesus, the same thing that Peter did to Jesus, they rebuke these people. Just as Peter rebuked Jesus when he thought that Jesus was somehow in conflict with God's will. They think, the disciples think that they understand how God's kingdom is supposed to work. They are confident that their thoughts and their feelings on the kingdom are true enough that they are going to outright ignore Jesus' own instructions, his own words on where children belong, which is right at the heart of the worshiping community. And they, and as they ignore Jesus' instructions, The crazy thing is, if you think about it, is that they actually are doubly ignoring God because they're ignoring the voice from heaven that told them to listen to Jesus, and they are ignoring the voice of Jesus who stands in front of them. There's sort of two layers of disobedience there. That's awesome. In many ways, most of what happens in these few chapters is some sort of restatement, like I said, of what Jesus has already said, whether it's in the Sermon on the Mount or what he's been doing uh, as he's been traveling around Galilee or uh, to some of the outer regions, so that as Jesus begins to make his way toward Jerusalem, and this is where we're at in the story, Jesus has begun to travel to Jerusalem. He's begun to predict his death, to announce he knows exactly where he's heading. As he does this, he's instructing his disciples in more and more concrete ways on what it means to follow him. And so essentially this whole passage that we we are sort of dealing with this morning deals with some really practical examples of what it looks like for someone to to carry a cross and to follow Jesus. And, And so one of the things that Jesus says is that following him looks like trusting him with the things that he's commanded us to do. Following Jesus looks like accepting a new social order where children have a place of importance and the important, the self-important, humble themselves. Whatever kinds of social reorientation a community needs to make, there's, there are words here for us uh, to, to hear. Following Jesus uh, looks like being radically committed to eliminating sin from our lives. Jesus speaks in some some fairly strong sort of hyperbole about the ways in which we might eradicate sin. And following Jesus looks like forgiveness, a lot of forgiveness. Because Peter comes up to him, knowing that Jesus is already taught, you are to be a forgiving people. Peter sort of asks, well, how many times should I forgive Jesus? Seven times? And Jesus says, 77 times. And following Jesus looks like maybe refusing to do something that everyone thinks is absolutely normal, like get married, if your heart is too hard to keep that commitment. And following Jesus looks like giving your wealth away if that is what is required to love your neighbor as yourself. As Jesus gets closer and closer to Jerusalem, as we hear the disciples ask questions, as we read about the disciples rebuking people, bringing children to Jesus, we are urged to answer the question for ourselves. Because the disciples have yet to listen and to trust Jesus. And so what do we do? 
as we read these instructions, as we read the words of Jesus calling us to follow him, as God speaks by his spirit through his words to us, are we eager to hear and to understand and to trust? Or do we press on as those who, as Jesus talked earlier in the gospel, who think we are wise in understanding, imagining that we already understand the kingdom, having nothing to learn from God, from his son, and from his word. What would you do if God spoke to you? And finally, how would a dramatic encounter with God affect you as a follower of Jesus? I, I can't answer this for you, but the overwhelming witness of scripture is that dramatic encounters with God do not bear fruit at least not fruit that lasts. Our goal as Christians should not be to create and recreate something like mountaintop experiences like what Peter and James and John have with God on this mountain. Our goal should be to seek God and to serve him here, now, in the ordinary rhythms and routines of our lives. Because if we can trust and follow him with our boots on the ground, in the grind of our daily lives, serving our neighbors, loving our enemies, forgiving those who've wronged us, welcoming children among us, maintaining our commitments, confronting brothers and sisters, and constantly seeking to be last in all things. I mean, this is the kind of life that bears fruit and that gives honor to God, as Jesus says it. The, the Christian publishing industry that's built up in our, our country has made a pretty decent fortune uh, in recent decades selling something called spiritual experience. The books that make the bestseller lists are, are all about how one might experience God. The contrast between these books and what we find in scripture is that the Bible doesn't teach us how to experience God. Most of the time when somebody experiences God, it's not by their own choice. It's because God showed up and that's not always good news. <laughs> the Bible teaches us to trust God regardless of our experiences. The Bible teaches us to evaluate our experiences based on the one true standard for human thriving, Jesus. The Bible teaches us that experience can often actually be the enemy of trust, as it is in the story of Israel, as it is in the disciples. Disciples often do experience God. But experience is not our aim. Trust is. Trust is what we've been invited to enter into and to embrace. And the God that we trust is the one that Jesus tells us about in Matthew 18, 14. What do you think, Jesus says? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go search for the one that went astray? And if he finds it truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over 99 that never went astray. So it is the will of my father who is in heaven that one of these little ones. So it is not the will that not is an important word in that sentence. It is not the will of my father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Our Father in heaven is the one who has faithfully pursued his sheep and who tells us that we can trust the words of his son, the shepherd who has compassion on his sheep. This is our invitation this morning.